my knees have got arthritis. Every day he says the doctor cures a kidney sponsolitis. Oh, oh the pain! Not oh, again. Uritritis, uveitis, retinitis, salpingitis, dermatitis and mumps. Meningitis group, bruises and bumps. Or another case of enteritis and screw. Not a bit about what else is new. Think I'll give them all a dose of my pink medicine. Try pink medicine. Why pink medicine? Educated patients always think pink medicine. Drink pink medicine. So, all symptoms vanish down the sink. Pink medicine. Drink pink medicine. Think pink medicine. Sit and take your medicine. Drink your thinking medicine. Think pink medicine. So. The pink medicine show titles will be back at the same time next week. Now it's time to join Derek Dickerson for Match of the Week. Right, you come on the spleen side and you move in on the gallbladder. And good luck! Let's go! Hello and welcome. Well, it was a great day for South Londoners when a crowd of 16 saw the new Fulham Temperance Hospital team make short work of a gallbladder inside 17 stone ex-West Ham supporter Eddie Woofington. <laughs> there was a feast of seven great gallstones and three of them were taken out in the 16th, 18th and 215th minute by new signing gastrointestinal surgeon Malcolm Grant. <laughs> the other four were taken out by Andy Jones Derek Kevin, and two of them by a new name to bar duck surgery, Red Run. <laughs> now, for a full report on the match, let's go over and join Dickie MacDonald at Fulham, talking to Malcolm Grant. Well, Malcolm, how do you feel about the result? Um, well pleased, Dickie, well pleased. Uh, well pleased, as it happens. Uh, weren't you worried at all in the first few minutes? Uh, a, a little worried, as it happened, you see. That... I thought the skin incision was going to fall a little bit short of the belly button, but then Derek walked in with the retractor and Trev here covered on the spleen side with the diathermy needle, and I was left through, straight through to the peritoneum. How did you manage to get so much bile juice out of that very small gallbladder? Well, I owe it all to the lad. <laughs> uh, Terry and Trev and Freddie. Um, I think if you're going to get a lot of bile and inspissated mucus out of a chronically inflamed gallbladder, you need lots of teamwork, lots of discipline, and, uh, and suction. That's right. It's a set piece, then, is it? Yes, we worked on it quite a lot in practice. Right, in practice. Uh, well, then, uh, the uh, big question. How do you fancy your chances of getting to Wembley? Well, it is Russia. I mean, we could get the Metropolitan Line and change it bigger. Or take a cab and get our chances on on the North Circuit. Yes, right? <laughs> Tactics, eh? Well, that's the best of luck. You'll be out celebrating tonight, then, will you? Oh, no. <laughs> yes, I suppose we all sort of slipped down to the Royal College of Surgeons and, and uh, flipped through a few back numbers of the Lancet. <laughs> in jubilant mood, the score once again, seven gallstones. This is Dickie MacDonald in Fulham, returning you to the studio, and David Coleman. It's springtime in the British Journal of Internal Medicine. Yes, in a leading article, you can read how Britain's rheumatism doctors are studying the effects of propionic acid derivatives on collagen metabolites in human knees. And that means knees, 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 and more knees in this British Journal of Internal Medicine. 
but it's not just knees that go knobbly in the spring. No, sir. When it's time for the hay fever shot, Achoo. or any other routine immunization procedure, where should you grab for the jab? It's the shoulder for the boulder. But if you sigh for the thigh, then read how a controlled clinical trial compares the way lipoatrophy and lipocyte fragmentation moieties are accompanied by transient rises in plasma chylomicrons and beta lipoproteins. Something you won't even see in Sweden. Only in this week's British Journal of Internal Medicine. And that's not all. Enter our free competition and win a spectrophotometer, an Astrut arterial blood gas tension analyzer, an operating quarterly diathermy unit suitable for transurethral resection, a 12-lead portable electrocardiograph in a leather carrying case, and a set of matching airport luggage. Plus, a special offer on this sexy wet look clinic with the only special stethoscope pocket that gives sexy doctors of today plenty of room to zoom. Yes, step in the spring, but spring in your step when you get this week's British Journal of Internal Medicine. It'll make your eyes water. <laughs> Good evening. In tonight's edition of Medicine in the Arts, we examine the influence on British poetry of Rudyard Kipling's tonsillitis. <laughs> Professor Arnold Schwartz is the cardiothoracic surgeon at the British Museum. <laughs> Professor Schwartz, how do you feel his illness affected the young Kipling? Well, we know that he was always a very insecure child. Do we? Yes, we do. <laughs> we know from his diaries that he could remember as far back as actually being inside the mother's womb. And it was, it was the memory of that time in the comfort and quiet and warmth that gave him his lifelong love of gas central heating. <laughs> was it? Yes, it was. And when he was admitted to hospital to, to have his tonsils removed, did this influence him at all? Oh, yes, it did, yes. We know that after his tonsils were removed, he suffered uh, feelings of acute rejection. Really? Yes, they threw away the wrong bit. <laughs> did they? Yes, they did. And uh, we also know that in hospital, he was, of course, separated from his brother, John, and his father, Dad. And <laughs> he was there surrounded by his favorite childhood fancies, ice cream and nurses in black stockings. <laughs> Later on in life, he would order up to two dozen ice creams and five nurses in black stockings. Did he? When he could. <laughs> And what, what of the poetry of this time of change and strife? Well, we have just unearthed a poem of him written just after he came out of hospital, written years before his poem, if it is simply entitled, But. <laughs> and tonight it's read for us by William Wordsworth, a consultant ear, nose and throat surgeon to the Liverpool Road Polytechnic. <laughs> Shall I revisit hospital and carefree days gone by? I'll not forgo what I'd forgot. Forgo, I'll not, not I. <laughs> long the moaning, long the aching, long the lines of patients ranked with throats from which the tonsils had been so cruelly yanked. <laughs> I do not want to see you more. Your wards my eye avoids. I left so much of me behind. I left my adenoids. <laughs> and yet, I would return to you, forgive your grim black side, and see that little staff nurse with the really neat back side. <laughs> Putting patients at their ease. Medical men are celebrating the night that they invent a new disease. <laughs> the patients had run out of colds and coughs and ills and woes. 
and ask their doctors to invent a new disease that goes so warm and wet and helps you get the most out of your nose. On the night that they invented sinusitis. <laughs> The socialists were cleansing fists and stirring up the mass To find a new disease to tease and please the working class Better red than dead, they said, and long live Lenin and Marx On the night the day invented Scarlet V There was Young and Freud and all the boys that wilted in the sun Depression and hysteria already had begun There was one for the price of two and now two for the price of one On the night that they invented schizophrenia <laughs> Uh, uh, pair of Irish labourers were really having fun Straining at a packing case that nearly weighed a ton They popped and moaned and popped and groaned until the job was done On the night that they invented double hood <laughs> It's only a stage we're going through. Then? then I had an affair with two members of an important political party, three magistrates. And then? Uh, then I had an affair with the entire Warwickshire Rugby Club <laughs> and the referee, <laughs> then the driver of the 715 to Paddington <laughs> and, uh, and all the passengers. Uh-huh. And then? Then... I had an affair with every one of the North Thames water board. <laughs> and the four policemen who came to see what the noise was about. I see. And then? Then I had an affair with another six members of Parliament and their secretaries and all the people in their constituencies. <laughs> and then the parliamentary whips. <laughs> Their secretaries and their chauffeurs. And then? And then I woke up. <laughs> thank you. The same time next week. Oh, yes, thank you, Doctor. Uh, that'll be eight pounds. Will you pay my receptionist? Yes. Nodrons, syrup of figs.
Nodrods. Get things moving. <laughs> Let's consider the headache. Now, in order to achieve a fuller understanding of the symptom of the headache, it's important that we take a look at the history, the evolution of it. So, let's go back in time. To this point here, 400,000 years BC, to the actual day when Neanderthal man first invented the headache. Now, why had the headache not been invented before? Hmm? Well, <laughs> before Neanderthal man, there were just dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs had two brains, one in the head end here and one in the tail end there. That meant that in an emergency, they couldn't distinguish between migraine and hemorrhoids. <laughs> we all know someone like that, don't we? Now, as I'm sure you're well aware, eventually the primeval swamps dried up and the dinosaurs evolved into two groups. One kept the brain in the head here, their tails got shorter and shorter, they evolved lungs, warm-bloodedness, haircuts and three-piece suits, and became homo sapiens. <laughs> the other group kept only the brain in the tail. They remained cold-blooded, they developed a thick skin, were slothful and slow-moving, and became estate agents. <laughs> now, I'm sure you'll know that Estate agents don't worry about the sort of things that give you and me no end of headaches. Well, that's because their brains shrank and shriveled up a quarter of a million years ago. <laughs> after the first boom in house prices. Now, at first, Neanderthal man thought that headaches were caused by evil spirits inside the skull. And that if you drilled a hole in the skull, the evil spirits would get out and the headache would go. This process was known as trepanning. If it succeeded, if it didn't, it was known as first-degree murder. <laughs> now, as modern science has told us, headaches are not caused by evil spirits. What they're actually caused by are little arrows <laughs> which rush up from the back of your neck, past the parietal lobe, past the Orlandic fissure, and smash into the inside of your foot. <laughs> and furthermore, we now know that bashing a hole in your skull doesn't really help the headache. And furthermore, the arrows absolutely ruin your carpet. Right, I think that's enough for today. I've got something of a migraine. again, Mr. Marubino. Yes! Ah, here he is. Eh? Ah, is every summer it is the same. Every summer, short of the breath and very heavy the coughing. Here in the eyes. Eh? Your eyes are coughing? See, I, uh, I think they smoke too much, you know? <laughs> you mean watering? <laughs> How long have your eyes been watering? Oh, watering too long time. Much too long time. Much, very too long time, eh? I don't know. What's the time now? I don't know. I can see you, eh? Your eyes are watering and you have difficulty seeing. See, they is uh, swollen so bad that I can't see. And I can't see so bad, I can't even see how bad they swollen, eh? I can't even see how bad I can't see, you know, eh? Your eyes don't look swollen to me. You see, they swollen so bad, even you can't see how bad they swollen, eh? And, Dottori, the pain. The pain? The pain. Tell me about the pain. For you, the doctor, you tell me about the pain, eh? It hurts. Hey, clever doctor, eh? <laughs> Mr. Rubino, have you tried bathing your eyes? Uh, it's forbidden. Why? It's the same like my mother. She had the same trouble. She was told not to go to the bathing with the eyes. Allora, my uncle, he says, Tonio, you got your mother's eyes. So I don't go to the bathing with them either, eh? <laughs> Mr. Rubino, I think you have got hay fever. Hey, hey, 
Dio mio, silenzio amore, che faccia il mio cuore, il povero santo in cima all'inferno così, questo è adesso, eh? What is this hay fever? It's an allergy to pollen. But I never been to pollen. All right, uh, I shall give you something to make the swelling go down. Make the swelling go down? No, thank you. I'm swelling enough down there already, thank you, eh? I'll tell you what, eh? I'll tell you. I tell you, I, I go to see proper doctor. I go to see proper doctor for the eyes, eh? I go to chiropodist, eh? Arrivederci, eh? <laughs> Right, nurse, where's this guy with the massive hemorrhage? Um, her doctor, it, it was me. <laughs> uh, it was me what told the nurse I'd had a massive hemorrhage. You don't look as though you've had a massive hemorrhage. Well, well no, I haven't. It, it, it was a ruse. A what? It, it was a ruse. I wanted to talk to you privately. Look. You bring me down here at three o'clock in the morning to say you want to talk to me privately? Yes. What is it? It's about my bowels. <laughs> Your bowels? I mean, what's the matter? Aren't they regular or something? Oh, no, no, I am regular. Every morning on the dot of eight o'clock. Every morning on the dot of eight o'clock? I mean, that's marvellous. What are you worried about? I don't wake up till nine. <laughs> 